Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar about municipal cultural planning. My name is Aubrey Reeves and I'm the Executive Director of Culture Days. I'm pleased to act as host and moderator today. This webinar is part of our monthly webinar series running through 2018 and we'll be announcing the next one soon. You can stay abreast of all of our Culture Days news by subscribing to our newsletter or following us on Facebook or Twitter. And a heads up that registration launch is coming very soon. So if you're signed up on the newsletter, you will get that notification as soon as it is live. Um, and I also like to take a moment to thank the Department of Canadian Heritage, whose funding has made the webinar series and other professional development resources possible. Before we get started, I'm going to go through a little general housekeeping. Oh, first of all, save the dates. Uh, Culture Days is September 28th to 30th, uh, 2018. Okay, so the general housekeeping. So everyone who is attending today is on mute, except for our panelists. Um, if you have questions uh, after each presentation, you can type them in the question box and I will be moderating questions over to our panelists. Uh, the recording of the webinar will be made available a few days after today uh, so that you can share it with your colleagues and friends. And um, uh, also the slides of the presentation will become available. Okay, so, so for those who are maybe a little less than familiar with uh, municipal cultural planning, um, I'm just going to start with the basics of what is it. So cultural planning is a process of inclusive community consultation and decision making that helps a local government identify cultural resources and think strategically about how these resources can help a community achieve its goals. It's also a strategic approach that directly and in indirectly integrates the community's cultural resources into a wide range of local government planning activities. The term um, emerged out of Europe in the 1960s and 70s as cities and towns faced changing economies and demographics. And as part of European urban regeneration strategies, cultural planning integrated the arts into other aspects of local culture and into the texture and routines of daily life in the city. Today, communities around the world are actively engaged in cultural planning and nurturing cultural development. Uh, um, cultural planning is a way of looking at all aspects of a community's cultural life as assets. And cultural planning considers the increased and diverse benefits these assets could bring to the community in the future if planned for strategically. So understanding culture and cultural activity as resources for human and community development rather than merely as products to be subsidized because um, they are inherently good for us and unlocking those possibilities for, um, for future value. And our understanding of culture um, is inclusive and broader than um, traditional high art uh, definitions of it. Um, then we have an increase, um, we, we have the um, increase the assets which, uh, with which we can address civic goals. So that's the, the basics. Um, and we are looking today in the presentation at the ways municipalities um, have developed municipal cultural plans um, and also how they have linked up to culture days. Um, many municipalities have gotten involved in culture days because they see it as a way of implementing their theoretical cultural plans, but others have even gone farther to actually build culture days right into their municipal cultural plans or have used it as an opportunity for consultation with the community, for launching the plans, and so on. We'll get into that in, um, a little bit later. So I'm going to introduce our speakers now. Um, we have Anna Wellen from the Creative City Network, Morella Tersini from the City of Vaughan, and Matthew um, Thompson, Thomas from um, City Proper. Um, and while I'm giving us a little bit of details about each one, I'm going to launch a poll so we also know a little bit about um, you um, and who we're speaking with today. So first up on our list of guest speakers is Anna Welland, a general manager of the Creative City Network of Canada. Anna has been with uh, Creative City since 2013, first as member services and communications coordinator, and then as general manager. The Creative City Networks um, of Canada mission is to connect and support cultural leaders and to nurture cultural development in local communities across Canada. As such, Anna's presentation will be providing a background in the services that Creative City Network can offer for municipalities involved in cultural planning. Um, with experience in education, both performing arts and arts management, Anna is passionate about ensuring that arts and culture in all its forms are supported at municipal, provincial, and federal level. Okay. 
second up, we will hear from Matthew Thomas. Matthew is a designer who works closely with cultural planners, city makers, and arts administrators. With City Proper, he combines his expertise in marketing, community development, and entrepreneurship to implement awards-winning communications campaigns and innovative design solutions for municipalities like Waterloo, Kitchener, and London, Ontario. Matthew uh, will be exploring in his presentation a couple of case studies for those uh, from those cities, demonstrating um, online cultural planning tools that are dynamic and engaging for the public. Uh, Matthew also lectures at the University, uh, um, sorry, at the Western um, University in Arts Management and Not-for-Profit Management Programs, and is a professor at Fanshawe College's Faculty of Art, Media, and Design. I'm going to launch our second poll here. Okay, so uh, finally we'll be hearing from Morella Tresini, um, who is the lead for cultural development of the city of Vaughan in Ontario. Morella is responsible for the activation of cultural initiatives and programs that foster cultural vibrancy and growth and making Vaughan a standout creative city. Uh, Morella will be speaking about how Vaughan has implemented its cultural plan through events such as Culture Day. Um, and the work she does to help facilitate and negotiate innovative partnerships with tourism sector, creative industries, and act as a liaison with the arts community of Vaughan and Greater GTA. Morella is also a practicing artist and um, an arts mentor. Okay, so we're just uh, about to close the final poll. If you haven't voted, please uh, do so now. All right, so let's see who is with us today. First of all, not surprisingly, the majority of uh, folks on the webinar today are a representative of the Municipality or Community Arts Council, uh, with a large number also coming from cultural organizations. That's not really a surprise for today's webinar, but it's great to see. And then second, um, we have a pretty even split between uh, returning um, community organizers and returning activity organizers. So very strong on um, uh, folks who have already participated in culture days and um, I guess are thinking about how they can take it to the next level with municipal cultural planning. So that's really great insight for our speakers today to get a sense of who they are um, presenting to. So thank you for completing the poll. Okay, now I am going to pass the microphone over to Anna. Um, so that she can uh, share her screen and tell us everything about Creative City Network. Okay, thank you, Aubrey. Let me just get my um, <laughs> to the full screen here. Sorry, just there we go. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Aubrey mentioned, my name is Anna Whelan. I'm the general manager of the Creative City Network of Canada. I am pleased to be here this afternoon to speak to you about the Creative City Network of Canada and the role that we play in supporting our members in cultural planning. This presentation will give an overview of the organization itself, and I will also go into more specifics regarding the programs and support that we provide our members and how they support cultural planning initiatives within the network. So what is CCNC and how does the work that we do support cultural planning in Canada? I'll start off by talking about our vision and mission. So our vision statement states that culture is a core pillar of sustainability, facilitating positive change through creativity and innovation and creating healthy, vibrant and engaging communities in Canada. Our mission, Creative City Network of Canada connects and supports cultural leaders, celebrates cultural excellence and nurtures cultural development in local communities throughout Canada. Creative City Network of Canada, or CCNC, is a national nonprofit organization that facilitates collaboration, knowledge sharing, research, and professional development for the cultural sector at the local level through the development of cultural policy, planning, and professional practice. CCNC's membership represents over 175 communities across the country, representing over 16 million Canadians. The organization exists to connect and educate the people who do this work and share this working environment so we can be more effective in cultural development in our communities. By sharing expertise, experience, information and best practices, members support each other through dialogue both in person and online. The organization was established in 2002 and while we did have some funding at the beginning, we 
due to changes in government that funding was no longer, but because we had um, a strong network of members, we managed to sustain ourselves. Be, uh, sorry, yeah, we had built a strong network of members and become vital and valued and made it made the case necessary as a national organization. So next, the goals of CCNC. Our goals uh, were developed in partnership with our membership, and they are to support cultural development across Canada, to connect cities and those working in the sector across the country, share knowledge, experience, and resource information with our members and stakeholders, and to enhance social, economic, cultural, and environmental sustainability. Lastly, our values, as you can see them up on the screen, the values of the organization guide the work that we do, and it is through collaboration, creativity, innovation, advocacy, inclusiveness, respect, and excellence that CCNC is able to meet our mandate and vision to our membership. And our membership, the, our membership is key to the work that we do. Without them, we wouldn't be a network. We would just be me sitting in an office in Vancouver. <laughs> so with 180 members across the country from municipalities ranging from 3,000 people to 2.8 million people, it is our membership that drives the organization. Over the years, through annual summits, regional meetings, and member surveys, we have reached out to our membership to ask what programs and support they need from CCNC to facilitate the work that they do. So how does CCNC support municipal cultural planning? With the needs of our members in mind, some of the ways that we support them in their work in local cultural planning is we offer a unique opportunity for our members to connect, learn, and share with each other. Like Culture Days, we strive to bring culture to the forefront to ensure that it is always part of the discussion. And as you all know, this work can't be done in a vacuum, which is why connection with colleagues across the country is so important. And as I mem uh, mentioned earlier, our membership, uh, it ranges from very small rural municipalities to large major centers. And we understand that there are a lot of differences in the way that those uh, municipalities and organizations work. So we constantly hear from our members that one of the most important roles and valued services of CCNC is to connect them to information and to each other. And we do this in a number of ways, both digitally through our members portal, portal our listserv, and a monthly newsletter, and in person through our annual Creative City Summit and our regional meetings. Our annual summit is the highlight of the CCN calendar, CCNC calendar. Through keynote speakers, panel discussions, peer-to-peer -peer presentations, and study tours, the annual summit provides delegates the opportunity to connect with their colleagues across the country. As the summit is hosted by a different municipality each year, it gives CCNC the opportunity to work with different groups of people each year, focusing on a theme that is relevant to that specific region and giving the host city the chance to highlight the issues and initiatives that they are working on in their area. Additionally, we've heard from our members that local connection is also very important and that approval for travel to the summits can be challenging for some members as it is difficult for departments that have numerous staff as approvals are usually only given to one or two, which is why we at CCNC are trying to put the focus on providing more regional meetings each year. And regional meetings are something that we look we get the assistance of some of our members to organize in specific regions. For example, in 2015, CCNC hosted an Ontario regional meeting to discuss the Ontario culture strategy. In 2017, the summit was held in Halifax, and hosting a summit in Halifax provided the network with a great opportunity to reach out to our members in Atlantic Canada and the opportunity to foster new relations with, relationships with communities in the region. After the summit, it became apparent that there was a need to reach out to regions where our membership isn't as strong, and the membership committee identified two areas for regional meetings in 2018. Saskatoon and Atlantic Canada. And like I mentioned earlier, we understand that the issues vary from region to region, which is why we are working closely with the members in both of those places to plan and deliver regional meetings that will align with current issues and trends relevant to the areas. Additionally, Saskatoon is hosting our 2019 Creative City Summit, so the Saskatoon Regional Meeting will also put some focus on asking our members and non-members in that region what they would like the summit to look like in in 2019 as far as programming content or issues that are issues that are um, are relevant to the area learning opportunities are another key deliverable for the C for CCNC as it provides its members <clears throat> sorry I'm gonna say that. learning opportunities are another key deliverable the CCNC provides its members in addition to the annual summit and regional meetings we provide our members with toolkits and research 
CCNC created three toolkits in 2010 in partnership with Legacies Now. There's a cultural planning toolkit, a cultural mapping toolkit, and a public art toolkit. They are available for free online on the CCNC website, and I believe Aubrey is going to uh, talk a little bit more about those after this. Um, our toolkits have become a valuable resource for members starting the process of creating new culture plans and for those who are in the process of updating theirs. In addition, we are hoping to secure funding to update our toolkits over the coming years and to develop a truth and reconciliation best practices toolkit in partnership with and in support of the truth and reconciliation movement. Sharing stories is a key element to success in cultural planning, and we provide our members with the opportunity to share best practices, successes, and case studies from their communities through peer-to-peer -peer presentations at our annual summit. Each year, we identify a handful of learning streams that are relevant to the current issues, and then we also put out a call for presentations at the summit. This year, we have four learning streams, reaching your community, culture economy, planning for a new world, and sustainability and cultural planning. And this is a, um, a key element of our providing our members with the opportunity to, uh, to speak to their colleagues, to learn from their colleagues in a different kind of platform that is different from sitting in a room with a keynote speaker. But this is your chance to share the stories that are happening in your community, get feedback from other members that are possibly dealing with the same kinds of issues and sharing success, but also learning opportunities where success maybe didn't happen. Um, lastly, research, which is, is an important component of our history, but unfortunately due to funding constraints, we've been limited to uh, deliver research in the past. However, we recently partnered with the Department of Canadian Heritage and Stats Can on the Cultural Satellite Project. This is an accounting framework created to better measure the economic importance of culture, arts, heritage, and sport in the Canadian economy. The CCNC members have the opportunity to become partners in this initiative, which gives them exclusive access to GDP and jobs data for their municipality or region. And having access to this data, as we know, further supports our members in the initiatives and, program, in initiatives and programs that they are working on in their community. And lastly, but definitely not least, celebrating. We understand the importance of celebrating the amazing work that our members do each year. We launched the CCNC Awards of Excellence program in 2016 with the goal of celebrating outstanding achievement of Canadian municipalities in the field of culture. In the two years the program has been running, we have had the opportunity to highlight the amazing work in cultural planning, public art, cultural events, and cultural leadership. Not only does it help us celebrate the work that you do, it adds another element towards our goal in making the case for culture. And you can, you can find out more about our awards program also on our website. So how can you become a creative city? To help your, achieve your potential as a creative city, you can join our network. Our membership is open to municipalities, organizations, and individuals. And our fees are based on, uh, for municipalities, they're based on a population size, organizations, they're based on your annual budget. You can participate in the 2018 Creative City Summit in Mississauga, which will be November 6th to 8th. The theme of this year's summit is Creative Disruption, Building a New Foundation for People, Places, and Spaces. You can visit our website for free resources, which includes our cultural planning, mapping, and our public art toolkits. Or you can reach out to us if you have questions and, uh, if you'd like us to speak at any upcoming events. Thank you very much for all of, uh, for your attention today. And I hope that uh, you have taken something away for this and I'm excited to hear your questions. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. Okay, so um, as she alluded to, I'm just going to pull up um, one uh, page out of the Creative City Network Toolkit, um, which shows different types of cultural planning uh, you can find this toolkit on their website. It is very detailed. There's 56 pages, so we're not going to go through every page of it, but I just wanted to highlight a couple things. Um, so uh, this page does show us lots of different ways uh, to do a cultural plan, and which goes to show there isn't one uh, right cultural plan for every community. It does need to be customized and developed locally with your community's needs in mind. Um, it could be something that is looking at um, a specialized art or cultural um, form, uh, um, a specific issue. Uh, many communities start with just a cultural map instead of a full plan, and then they build from there. Um, so that is a really great um, inventory of the different approaches. Um, also, um, I wanted to highlight 
from that toolkit, I've uh, just pulled out uh, some key characteristics of a successful cultural plan from the toolkit. So uh, some things to keep in mind is uh, to develop a local definition of culture. Um, it should involve community development approach. So that's consulting with a wide range of people in the community uh, that represent the diversity of your um, municipality, um, the diversity of cultural practitioners, um, as well as uh, elected officials and other community leaders. Um, the Creative City Network recommends it has a strong focus on cultural resources. Um, and that it places a focus on the people rather than the facilities. So that um, it's about building relationships, networks, and partnerships in your community rather than immediately jumping to, oh, we need to build a theater or a community arts center. Um, there's also, it's really important to not only have a local definition of culture, but to really have an emphasis on what is uh, specific and unique to your community. So the, those things that are um, your true identity, the place making and that your citizens will have community pride in. And then finally, if your plan is trying to address certain social issues, um, to be uh, very mindful of including those living with and experiencing those social issues in the process itself so that they um, are um, uh, authentically represented in the proposed um, outcome. And then also to think about is uh, whether your community is actually ready for cultural planning. Um, here's some questions from that toolkit um, that you should think about before uh, launching the uh, cultural planning process. So um, the first and foremost is what do you actually want to achieve? Uh, I think it's also very important to have the right um, political support as well as bureaucratic support um, in your municipality so that you can undertake it um, effectively. Um, as I mentioned, a successful plan represents the diversity of the community. Um, not to be forgotten is, do you actually have the funds allocated and available to do the planning? It does cost money to do. It takes time and effort and um, consultation events and, and so on. So it's, it doesn't have to be an enormously costly process, but there does, does need to be some resources allocated. Um, and is it supported by the cultural uh, leaders in your community? Um, because they are going to be amongst your biggest advocates and also contributors to the plan. Um, so those are some really important things to think through before undertaking a cultural plan. And then um, the major steps and the timelines um, here are what's in the, the Creative City toolkit, but of course it really depends on the scale of your community, how extensively you're doing some of these stages such as consultation. Um, so this is just a, a guideline. But step one is your preparation. Um, step two would be information gathering and research. So finding out who are those cultural leaders in your community, what, what resources are there. Then assessment and analysis. Um, step four is organizing and consultation. And this is um, a very important part, um, meeting with citizens and the cultural sector and uh, really digging into what your community needs and already has. Um, and what needs support down the road. Um, then of course you act, the plan has to be written. Um, step six is um, often um, a draft plan will be released um, at which point there's another round of consultation um, before it is finalized and adopted and then um, launched and actually implemented. Um, wanted to highlight that many communities have actually involved Culture Days um, in various steps of this planning process. So some communities have started with um, looking at who has historically participated in Culture Days as a starting point for who are the artists and cultural organizations in their community. It gives them a list to begin with. Um, others have actually launched consultation sessions during the Culture Days weekend, um, in particular at hub locations where they know there's going to be a lot of uh, their um, local citizens, especially those who are engaged already in culture. So it's a good opportunity to meet with them and get their feedback. Um, and then uh, others have actually launched brand new plans during the Culture Days weekend um, and made a bit of a celebration of it, incorporated into their Culture Days events. Um, and then the, step nine is where we have seen the most um, integration of culture days with municipal culture planning is the in the implementation that 
a lot of municipalities see this as an opportunity to activate something that um, up until that point was fairly um, theoretical, but now they can actually um, do the things that have been set out as goals. Uh, and common goals in cultural plans are, are very common with Culture Days. So raising public awareness about um, the artists and cultural organizations in your community, engaging citizens, um, uh, demonstrating the impacts of culture in our community. So those are all very close fits, of course. Okay, so now we have a moment for um, questions. Um, you can type them into the question box for Anna, um, and then we will be moving to our next speaker. So um, off the top, uh, Anna, there's a question here about, um, you mentioned different sized municipalities. How does uh, Creative City serve those different sides. So for instance, um, a rural community uh, needs are quite different than a major urban center. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think how we do it, one of the things, so I mentioned our annual Creative City mm -hmm. Summit and we do, we do host the summit in a different city every year and we accept bids from all sizes of cities. And we, we really, one of our goals is to reach out to everyone who might be interested in hosting a summit so that we can get a representation of cities of all different sizes. Um, I mean, I know Halifax isn't a small rural city, but it was where it was situated in Nova Scotia last year. We we did, um, when we put together our programming, we were we were really trying to hear, hear about, sorry, we were, we were really trying to focus on not just the programs happening in big centers, so things in rural cities, so to talk about those types of issues. And so um, we, we brought, oh, sorry, I'm not, I'm getting all flustered. Um, so through our summit programming, our speakers and focus, getting getting feedback from our members on what they would like to hear at our summers, our summits. So speakers present, present uh, P2P presenters from places from all different sizes so that we can hear from those people at our summit um, about what are the issues that they are dealing with in their, in their area. And also our regional meetings is something that we are, trying to focus on for 2018. And I mentioned uh, reaching out to places where our membership isn't as strong. And it tends to be places like Sask Saskatchewan where most of the, there's only two large centers there. So reaching out to our members in Saskatchewan so that we can um, pull in people's feedback from smaller places to hear what are their needs, what can Creative City do for them. And so we've heard that it is regional meetings. It's uh, getting together in places where they can get to, uh, where they have the, you know, the, fun the funding to get to that smaller meeting as opposed to sometimes traveling very far to our, to mm -hmm. our annual summit. Okay, um, great. So we have one more question here. Are there any toolkits to evaluate the implementation of cultural plans through Creative uh, City Network? Um, like a sample cultural report card or um, that uh, they can use to highlight to council. This person is saying our cultural master plan was improved in 2013 and they now want to do a five-year review. Um, not, so we don't have anything like that, but that's a, that's a really good question. And I know um, we, are, we, have, we are hoping to revamp our toolkits, but if that's, if that, whoever this is, if they want to send me an email, that's something that um, I can, we can we can t take a look at and see if there's if there's something further in there. So we don't have anything like that, um, but that's something to further explore for sure. Sounds like a needed resource for the yeah. future. Thanks yeah. for that feedback. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So right now I'm just showing the results from the poll um, with uh, showing that the majority of people here are from um, mid-sized communities, so twenty thousand to a hundred thousand. Um, but it's a fairly even split between all sizes. We've got those very small communities here too. In mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to um, switch us over now to Matthew um, and move us along. Hi, everyone. Hi. Okay, I just wanted to echo um, a little bit of that information. I think. Uh, Culture Days, in my experience, uh, I was at uh, Museum London in London, Ontario for nine years and Culture Days was always uh, one of the best attended uh, events of the year. It just brought a lot of people out and it just had a really great feeling. And I know that the Arts Council uh, in London, Ontario does a really great job of animating it uh, across the whole city. So it's a really great, uh, really great event, really great uh, resource for, for a lot of places. Um, so I really wanted to pick up on uh, that last presentation 
and talk a little bit about uh, implementation of plans. And um, and actually, there was a question there about uh, how do you support uh, the success of a plan using data? And I'm going to touch on um, all of that. So cultural planning online and on the street. So when I talk to most uh, cultural planners, um, uh, in cities, uh, arts administrators, uh, a lot of us uh, kind of have this vision in our head of what this ideal uh, could be in our city, of what um, of what our city could look like. And I think if, when you're a tourist and you're traveling around the world, uh, one of the things you always remember uh, from a city is its main street. And I think a lot of people envision uh, in their city uh, a scene similar similar to this. Um, an ideal city has a place for where people um, of all types of communities can uh, come together. There's uh, social cohesion. There's spaces for artists. There's uh, independent shops. And overall, you get a really good uh, impression of the city uh, and where you are based on that uh, on that main street. Uh, however, it always kind of uh, remains. Uh, this ideal and uh, and it's actually not overly obtainable for uh, for most communities. A lot of communities have to simply work with uh, the resources and assets that it has, and a lot of them don't you know don't have um, something like this um, in their city. But uh, but that's actually that's actually okay. Uh, as Aubrey was uh, saying, a lot of times uh, cities I find um, to kind of get to this ideal. Their immediate reaction is to uh, invest in infrastructure projects. Uh, if your city needs a, a boost in culture, you want to be, uh, you know, kind of create social cohesion or support artists uh, in your community. Uh, typically, the, the first thing that I'll say is we need we need a new performing arts center. We need a new, you know, gallery space. We we need, uh, you know, the orchestra needs a new space and. Uh, you know, and that could be the solution sometimes, but uh, but really, what I suggest is that you really want to meet the people where they already are, and where almost uh, most of the citizens in cities now are are online, uh, and and expect you know expensive infrastructure projects uh, aren't the solution every single time, and so really, what I do um, is I work with digital tools to help create kind of mimic the same ideal that this picture or kind of the, the vision that many of us would have in our minds. And um, we mimic that through through digital tools. And so, you know, infrastructure projects may not work because uh, I don't know if, if anybody was familiar with, uh, um, uh, you know, some of the most recent uh, uh, Adaptive reuse campaigns, uh, where a lot of pop-up galleries are coming, or or big festivals, events are taking over old warehouses, and those typically, you know, aren't necessarily uh, uh, recognized as assets. So Jane Jacobs in uh, the Death and Life of Great American Cities wrote, "We expect too much of new buildings and too little of ourselves." So uh, what I focus on and what I'm going to present is a uh, is a, a few examples of. Uh, of investing in people uh, over kind of uh, over new buildings, and so one of the best ways that uh, I think we can do this is uh, is by using the digital tools that already exist. So uh, a Pew Research poll said that of people, you know, they said most people have 648 Facebook friends, and most of those people we know are old people from high school. I heard a joke recently that uh, that you know. We gave up a lot of our privacy on Facebook to find out what our high school friends were having uh, for dinner, and uh, and so Facebook and other digital tools are really great at connecting us to our old friends, colleagues. Um, but what uh, the data also revealed is that only two percent of Facebook friends are neighbors. Uh, so it's not actually great. These digital tools aren't exceptional uh, at meeting new people and creating that social cohesion that we're uh, that so many of us are looking for. So, with that in mind, uh, London, Ontario, uh, was uh, looking to um, uh, create uh, a sense of place. Uh, it was uh, it was looking to connect its artists. Um, it was looking to uh, to bring people together and create a more vibrant. Uh, Creative scene to attract and retain uh, creative industry workers, and so we—I was part of a team that developed something called 
uh, London Fuse, and London Fuse was a digital platform that uh, mimics that street. It's uh, it's uh, created a platform to uh, to for people to log in with their social media accounts, uh, to connect uh, to connect it digitally, and to post their uh, events um, to uh, to post their events to uh, to write articles and share different types of content and to generally uh, make a scene uh, in, in London, Ontario. And, uh, and digitally, we were able to uh, connect with a lot of people, uh, a lot of cultural creators, uh, people in the creative industries. Uh, and what is amazing is when you invest in a digital platform for people, they show up and they begin to use this tool. And so um, a lot of communities are struggling with uh, coverage for local media and arts uh in, in their newspapers or, or online and what this digital platform was really uh great at doing was creating a space for people to uh to um to connect with one another but also tell their stories of the projects that that they're working on and uh it was a space to uh uh both upload videos and uh, there was a team of content creators who created videos to showcase the artists and creative people in the in the community so what we found then is that you can actually uh, create digital density, that same uh, streets. You can uh, create a platform for you know, thousands of people to, uh, to get together, meet one another, and uh, ultimately fulfill uh, parts of a culture plan. So we had uh, 1,500 um, active uh, users, which in the community the size of uh, London, uh, it was, uh, was really nice because uh, it was really the, the uh, the, the small percentage of the people in the community who are really um, uh, participating and, and making a vibrant cultural scene in the city were able to connect uh, when otherwise they may not have been able to. Uh, we did a survey and most of them identified in the arts and creative and cultural communities. Uh, and then there were other people who, who uh, identified themselves in, in other, in other uh, venues too, which complemented uh, what we were working on. And uh, the number one reason why people uh, use this digital platform was because they wanted to find out what was going on. And as we know, events like, uh, like Culture Days are a great way to actually uh, implement a, a culture plan. And so it was really great to see that um, uh, it became the go-to resource for finding out what was happening um, in their city. And again, if you create a platform, people use it. So people were creating articles, posting, uh, videos and photo galleries of what was happening in the city and it really brought people um, really brought people together so ultimately digital density equals real density and uh, and so this doesn't exist just as a digital platform but these digital platforms had real world results uh, including you know uh, um, Paul Butler the artist and curator uh, works with uh, worked with the team to create a documentary that brought the community out to celebrate uh, um, a local uh, local artist, uh, Greg Curnow, uh, through a bike ride, an art project. Uh, Pop-up groups uh, uh, emerged uh, every Wednesday. People through the community decided that they wanted to get together and ride their bikes and, and go to galleries. And uh, Wednesday night bike rides became became a real thing. And actually, I was at the park last week, and uh, and it was a nice day. And their group was still meeting, which is pretty remarkable. Um, so this platform also uh, brought people together to create things like like street festivals. Our street festival emerged from the community that was participating in this uh, online. Grickle Grass is one of uh, London, Ontario's, I would say, uh, neatest uh, events because it's adaptive reuse of um, a children's museum to become, uh, during the day, an event for children, and in the evening, an event for adults with concerts. And it's really um, hopeful because this platform is being uh, replicated and uh, used in other communities. Thunder Bay recently launched uh, The Trunk, which serves as kind of a, a tourism and uh, cultural planning platform. And so communities have been involved in a few others. Communities are adapting this platform. And ultimately, uh, not only does it kind of help fulfill culture plans, but it helps uh, justify and uh, let you know how it's working. Um, Audrey, Audrey brought up uh, cultural mapping, and cultural mapping is great at understanding what resources, uh, taking the inventory of resources in your community, um, 
but uh, but what kind of lacks, I feel, between culture maps is um, is kind of this idea of taking instead of a snapshot of cultural resources, feeling the pulse of what's happening in your city. And uh, so with the digital platform, we're able to create a dashboard which allows you to see who the cultural influencers are. These are the people who you may need to know uh, uh, and base that against metrics that, uh, that you're looking for, such as eventfulness or social cohesion. You can create metrics and, uh, and actually see every day um, how you're doing in terms of, uh, of, of uh, tracking your culture plan. So it's been a really um, successful um, uh, project. It's really great to see it being replicated over and over again. And, uh, and I feel like um, I always kind of felt like it took cultural planning uh, years to, um, to, be, uh, to be taken notice in most cities. And now um, through the work of the Creative Cities Network, it's really, I think cultural planning's time has really come and being equipped with the proper tools, I feel like um, the future of city making is really belongs to, uh, to cultural planners. So thanks for, uh, for letting me speak. I'm looking forward to uh, any questions that you have. Great. Thank you, Matthew. For, you did touch on this briefly with some really great examples of like the bike ride, but um, uh, one person is wondering is, are there other ways besides digital applications to ensure that a cultural plan is a dynamic living plan and not a dusty document forgotten at City Hall? Hmm. That's, a really great, uh, that's a really great question. And so um, I always feel like, um, Culture plans, depending on on the amount of time that uh, typically they're going between five and 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 ten years, it's always best to have uh, uh, the same steering committee who is involved in its uh, creation is to have check-ins regularly. So I feel like um, a lot of plans do kind of sit as as documents. But um, if you're able to create, if you actually have a goal and understand um, any sort of metric to uh, uh, to see how you're doing. Uh, Kind of more regular uh, checkups um, with those same uh, people who were involved in creating the plan uh, will kind of sh will give you the opportunity to uh, judge how well it's working and also iterate along the way. And I really feel like iteration is the key here. I think that's what the digital platform does really well is you can look at information over a few months and say how are we doing? What else do we need to invest in? Or what should we be focusing on? And so uh, more regular check-ins I think are the the, the uh, is the key there. Great. Um, here's another question. Do you know of best practices in digital cultural planning for a broad definition of cultural heritage, arts, cultural landscapes, and living heritage? So what she's getting at is the intangible that makes a place unique and connects us to our community. Yeah. So actually, I, haven't, I don't feel like that's been well-defined uh, yet because it's still a fairly new uh, field. So I'd be interested in, uh, in uh, in, in developing that and hearing uh, more information because I feel like that's that is definitely a discussion that we need to have and um, and so uh, I, you know cultural planning until very recently hasn't has been about um, about about structures about places and um, and as we move to people I really feel like digital platforms are going to be the key to reaching people and managing uh, that asset and um, and so I don't feel like it's been well defined yet but I, hopefully it will be Hmm. So we've identified yet another resource that um, people are looking for. Great. Okay, as people um, complete that poll, just one other question uh, really about um, how much of these projects are you managing um, with City Proper and how much is being really managed by the municipality? So that dashboard, for instance, yeah. the staff of the city have full control of that? The Okay, so uh, the city takes over um, uh, more than 50% of the control. So, so there really is um, involvement in managing a community like that. So you really need to um, be checking it daily to uh, curate content. Although it's an open platform for anybody to submit, there is kind of the opportunity um, for municipal cultural workers to, uh, to vet that information so that it, it, um, it meets the guidelines of, of what you're setting out to do. And so, um, so there are definitely resources that you need to allocate on the city side to uh, to managing that. But I would say uh, through city proper, um, uh, we we have experience in both sides. So there are some projects where where uh, 
city proper is doing kind of most of the managing of that community. Um, and uh, there's another project where, where the city does most of it. But the cultural dashboard uh, is, is, uh, is something that um, any cultural worker or, or municipal worker can really log into at any time to, to check in and update. So that's not, really, um, that's not really managed as much as it's more of a portal to view how information is being displayed. I could see that as being quite important for advocating um, within a municipal structure for the, the role that culture is playing in the city. Yeah, I think I think um, cultural planners uh, traditionally don't necessarily have the uh, the data they need to back up what the good work that they're doing, and and really I think um, what we lack are slides that show uh, progress going you know up and to the right in in uh, in kind of Excel forms and graphs, and so um, the I think the cultural dashboard has been really popular because it provides that type of information now to justify um uh to justify the really great work that we're doing mm -hmm. great thanks so as everyone can see this is the result of the last poll um whether your municipality has a cultural plan and, and surprisingly 50 percent more than 50 percent said yes um and even uh five percent have had several iterations so um it's pretty common it seems amongst this group um but i guess people are here to learn more and to improve them so thank you everyone for completing that poll. And we are going to our final speaker, um, Morella. Hi there. You can see Hi. it? Is yes. it on? Yes, <laughs> Good. <you> can see <laughs> it. Okay. Hi everyone. My name is Morella Tricini and I'm creative and culture development officer here at the city of Vaughan. And um, I wanted to talk today a little bit about um, the sort of dovetailing off of a lot of the great information that's coming in from Creative City that we use a lot and some of the things that um, Matt touched on when it comes to sort of the digital um, the um, sort of the digital planning component um, for um, in the when it comes in regards to culture days so as a city um, our culture services delivers a lot of a variety of different services and programming through the city and a lot of it we've already adopted um, a culture and public art framework um, plan and uh, the precursor to that was our creative together uh, cultural study in 2010 so um, we incorporated Culture Days into that culture and public art framework study so that we could start looking at using it as a tool to start building, um, looking at building out our um, creative and cultural economy, looking at some of the, um, the tourism sectors that we want to start looking at growing out. Since our city is now really in a great time of... Um, of um, growth and we're, we're developing a, an area of our downtown called the Vaughn Metropolitan Center. We just recently got the subway coming up. So there's a lot of really good, exciting um, development happening where it's, it's really setting us up for some great opportunities for, um, for successes with, um, with placemaking and, and cultural planning and programming and opportunities for, for partnering and, and for artists and creatives. So, um, let me just go to the next one. Oops, oops, sorry. I'm gonna go back. <laughs> uh, my apologies. I can't go back here. Uh, previous, previous. Okay. So if you can see, we just wanted to give you an idea. The city of Vaughan is kind of unique in the sense of how broad it is, going from east to west. Um, one of the things that we started looking at when we were looking at planning for culture days, um, and we started in 2010, was how would we get people coming across the city to sort of experience a lot of the of the programs and the opportunities that some of the artists and our businesses, creative businesses in the city, would like to offer. So some of the spaces we were looking at to activate was um, spaces like the community centers, some of our heritage sites. Um, some of our parks and there's a lot of places of worship in our city that also have spaces that um, are open and amenable to um, to be activated. Our city hall, we have a new city hall that's got a lot of space and open to the right in the middle of a, a, a big residential area in the city of Maple in the town of Maple. Um, and then we have activators in our community. Um, so right from community groups all the way across to artists, businesses, church groups, etc. So what we wanted to do is develop opportunities where 
these experiences for people in the community would be happening so make them accessible. So what we did initially when we first started Culture Days in 2010 was look at the formatting for some of our information once we had a listing of people who were interested in participating. And the problem was the first time we, we went ahead with it was we had very little um we don't even have the first one we have here because it's it was kind of lame. We just had about three or four act activities, and some of them were through the libraries. Just we started looking at where do people go, how how can we provide an experience in a in a space that's accessible and easy to get to. And then we started getting more and more interest, and um, we led we we lead the Culture Days um, event or initiative in Vaughan, but. What we're looking at now and it's happening slowly on its own, developing literally on its own, but we're we're supporting and encouraging is that we're looking at maybe um, having our activators look at leading certain areas in the city as well. So we looked at the format of how to um, package some of these activities. And so the, in the beginning, we looked at some of these foldouts with maps because people were very unfamiliar with this type of program and this type of event. We've not had anything like Culture Days in the city before 2010. So we looked at, you know, offering them through um, looking at um, spaces that were going to offer multiple activities across the city. So we were looking at the city hall format, community centers, um, heritage sites. So we, and with every year we did surveys with both the activators and the participants, and we started to get more and more closer to trying to come up with a model that would be best suited for for both and um we we started coming up with the idea for as a uh, to create hubs so our hub model wanted uh, with our hub model we started looking at activating uh more than 10 activities in one sector going from east to west so we divided Vaughn into three areas east west and central Vaughn and we started to use feature activities for each one of those areas as well to help launch the um the uh the beginning of culture days as well as help get a lot of people in one area in one activity to look at trickling down into some of the other activities available in that area as well so they were accessible and easy to get to uh at various scheduled times one of the things that ended up working out really well for us is looking at pre-event social media posts and la the launch event. So we really use the launching of Culture Days as a catalyst to start looking to getting people to kick off the entire weekend and looking at where would they like to go for some of the activities and looking at multiple activities at that at those locations. So we we developed a lot of the our, our graphics team here is wonderful and we've developed a lot of of graphics and um uh, multi-use uh, postings that even our activators could use that would help also uh, engage their social media um, platforms to start looking at um, coming to and attending the events or taking on those experiences. Um, some of these were the posts that were used last year um, and we looked at uh, last year we used a unique we also celebrated the uh, Canada 150 so we also sort of leverage that with some of our events and the ones that you see with the Canada 150 uh, logo on it were the actual programs that we got funded for 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 last year that we ended up um, rolling into our Culture Days activities. So they became features. We had great responses with this. I mean we've we had a lot of movement and a lot of of um, of activations coming through that. Um, when we look at some of the resources that of, of support and promotion that we provide to our activators. We have the availability of citywide mobile signs. The signs are set up across the city and um, there's about 12 of them and there, there there's some jumbo signs, just four of them I believe, and then the, the, the messages through that happens the month before and throughout the weekend. Um, then we have mobile signs that we also um, have budgeted for and those are those work out really well for our, for our city and what we did was we were able to customize the sign and the messages for each hub location so it features some key activations and in different intersections that were really busy so it started pulling in so repeating the messages and pulling in more and more people who wanted to participate or visit some of those activities as well as we started looking at 
um, using a lot of social media community influencers that were already involved in our community in going around that we were recognizing we're already attending events, um, supporting city um, programs, and we um, we wanted to feature them, use them as a feature, and have them feature us as well. So there was sort of an exchange of of um, of uh, services there. So that really uh, really changed the the um, activity online for us and provided us a lot more um, visitor attraction. Um, we had some of our activators become our little literally hub photographers and so that they would share those pictures and post and then we could share those posts as well and use them as features f to sort of celebrate the event, the success of the event. And we had lots of activator engagement. Morella, so we have time yeah, for almost, questions if you can wrap okay. it up quickly. Thanks. Yeah, and so I just wanted to show some of the hub activation and how we featured it. These are some of the printed, some of the printed um, um, items and, and promotional collateral. This is what our, um, our our how it looked, how we set up the hub um, listings in our brochure last year. And these are some of the the social media um, sort of analytics of what happened with us and what the successes were from last year. So we've got all that listed there. So um, I'm hoping that we can share all this as well <laughs> later on. Um, and then this is just sort of a little bit of a, a quick overview of what our next focus will be, which will be the Vaughan uh, Metropolitan Center Hub and a lot more activations and pop-up ideas happening for this coming year's uh, Culture Days uh, programming and activations in the city of Vaughan. Thanks, and that's Mara. it. I'm sorry if I ran out of, <laughs> uh, too quickly, but I just wanted to get through some of the uh, great sort of stories and successes we've had in our city with taking, a, you know, constantly um, sort of surveying and looking at and asking questions with our activators and our participants about how to make things better every year and how to provide more support and more experiences that, you know, can be shared, even not just on site, but online. So, yeah, there's been some amazing success stories. In, in class, yeah. So thank you for that. Um, I want to know at what stage of the cultural planning process did Vaughn identify that it wanted to become involved in Culture Days? That was early on. It was actually the, uh, when we did our Creative Together plan in 2010, um, it was introduced to me. And at that point, I was looking at what, 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 what we could do to start looking at integrating some of those goals and objectives uh, with some of the programming that what one was lacking and one I was researching, and that's how I found out about Culture Days. We hadn't even, we have, we've never, we no one knew about it here in Vaughan, and that's that's when we started to get on board. So 2010, our Creative Together plan was was the initial time that we started looking at using Culture Days to, as as the model, and we love the model of it too. The whole idea of it being national and then it being local, so it's it, it suited a lot of the um, components that we were looking at for um, interaction from both the city part and the municipal and federal. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a question here that really is for all of you. Um, do all of you recommend that a culture plan be a separate document from the recreation master plan? Does anyone want to that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know uh, in Vaughan, you have actually um, moved culture uh, from one department to another, but um, could you speak to right. that a little bit? Yeah, I just um I think our, our recreation team is, is amazing, our department's amazing, the programming is is prolific. And it it what happens is the association sometimes looking at giving the the time and the the expertise in the cultural sector but it not not by it by uh on doing it on purpose and it seems to get buried because the it was a it's more of a revenue generating model through our recreation um, department and culture isn't necessarily always looking at it from from with that sort of model and rather than building the support and building the sustainability and building out the development through the cultural sector we having it sort of looking secondary to the revenue generating model that they were, that the most of that department does hinders I thought we found that it hindered our development a little bit. Um, so when we did the transition into economic development, it was just a, a, a much better fit. It was a perfect fit for us because we're doing both the culture development and creative development economy through it and then providing the sustainability of the support, the expertise to all the artists and our creative industry people here. So for us, it's much much better model. It worked out much better. Mm -hmm. um, Matthew or Anna, do you want to address that question at all? 
I think I, I think it depends on the size of the municipality and and how it, how it kind of internal structures are are set up. Um, I think you know if culture, from my experience, almost is is usually um, working with economic development, but I could see it I could see it kind of working with uh, with parks and recreation. Um, it, I think it just depends on the makeup and the size of the community, and so. You know, I always advocate for for uh, culture to be to be included in as in as kind of many departments as possible in any sort of way. If a culture plan can um, uh, uh, can include uh, different departments and be and be invested in those, then I feel like it will, it will probably be more successful. And so and so it depends on each community, but I always try to um, I, I would like to see um, as many departments as possible kind of uh, being brought in, and at least in the initial discussion of a culture plan, if not its implementation. Okay, we have another question um, for all of you. How do you get the decision makers, i.e. city council, on side with uh, undertaking a cultural plan for the first time? What is the best way to advocate for it in my city? Marilla or Matthew, anyone uh, wanted? In our case, we what we did was put together a um, it was it was the timing factor for us too. It was part of the, the master plan, mm -hmm. so um, we just you know what we did is build it out and represented it. It was it was already there was already buy-in within the master plan. It wasn't really much of an effort for us to start looking at the culture, the developing culture studies and and. Um, developing a plan. I mean, it was already within one of the master plans so that for us, it was just a matter of, okay, the timing and, and getting the funding and the money to, to, to get it going and then reporting on it to council. And it was, they were very supportive anyway. So that, that in our end, that's what happened with us. Mm -hmm. Anna, do you have any insight um, from the Creative City Network perspective that do you hear from communities wondering how do they get, get it going? Yeah, C can you hear me? I wasn't sure if. Yeah. Yes, yeah okay. Can. Yeah. Um, I think hearing from our communities on that, um, it is exactly that. It's getting support from council, and I think having um, numbers and and attached to dollar amounts and that kind of thing. And so, we've been working with Stats Canada, our Department of Canadian Heritage, with our cultural statistics strategy. And I've I've heard from some members who are a partner who are partners in that that now that we've released those statistics to them they're excited to take that to their to their managers and to their council to say here here are the numbers here's here's what culture does for our economy and so they're excited about those specific numbers so um so that that would be my my response from what i've heard from uh from our members who are partners in our cultural statistics uh stats and numbers are really are really key mm. Yeah, um, and how about actually looking at other communities' cultural plans? If you, um, there are quite a few out there that are publicly available on websites. Is is that something that you recommend? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and we are we do host we do ask our members to send us their cultural plans to to put on our website so that people can use that as a resource to you know to up uh, as a resource to share uh, whether they're creating a cultural plan. Uh, they can see what what other cities are doing, especially if it's cities uh, and municipalities that are of similar size to them. Um, but I, I think I hear, we do hear from our members that regardless of, of city size, uh, having examples of cultural plans is always, is always very helpful. But if you can find one that is similar in, in scope for, for that municipality, that's, that's always a, a benefit, yes. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, we don't have any other questions, so we're gonna wrap this up now. Um, thank you to everyone for your excellent questions and a big thank you to our presenters for their insight. We hope that everyone found this to be an insightful and helpful webinar. A brief survey will launch at the end of the session. Please take a moment to provide us with your feedback. It is really uh, only seven questions, so it'll take you just a minute. Um, and the recording of this webinar will be available in a few days on our website if you wish to review it um, and share it with your colleagues. Um, you can also check our resource section for our, uh, dozens of helpful tip sheets and toolkits, um, as well as the recordings of previous webinars. The 2018 participation guide is now available. It is really the, the one-stop shop for everything you need to know about planning and organizing culture days. It's also a really excellent resource for 
um, municipality to share with their local artists and cultural organizations that you want to get geared up for um, being involved in culture days. And stay tuned for upcoming announcements about the rollout to registration. Um, so take care, everybody, and thank you. Um, have a good rest of your day.